This is going to be one of those stories that's a little harder to tell because ultimately, ultimately, it caused great change in my family. But the story for today is about Christmas 2012. And I chose that year because, one, it was the year of the apocalypse, which clearly didn't happen in any sense that anybody expected, but because for me anyway, it was very much like an apocalypse, if you understand what the moment represented. In, in the early 2000s, I began working in long-term care insurance, and the work that I do is really important to me. I, it has to be fulfilling. I have to feel like I'm really meeting a need. And so being in long-term care insurance was really a perfect fit because I'd been a nursing assistant, and you know, I, I had all sorts of experience in long-term care. I knew people who needed long-term care. And so it was very fulfilling to do for a number of years. And then I remember in January of 2009, right after the crash, the company I worked for laid off 20% of its workforce, 5,000 people. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, we had 5,000. We let off, I think it was 1,000 people. And it was a, an incredible change because it included the uh, individual who mentored me through my entire wholesaling career. And I was, it was devastating. And it was mostly odd because at the time in 2008, 2009, when this was occurring, I had been a financial services wholesaler. I'd worked with brokers and financial planners. Nobody had mentioned that there was a housing bubble of any sort. And so, in January of every year, I would create a marketing plan. And I remember sitting there and I said to myself, I said to myself, hey, you know, what's going on? I just, I don't understand what's going on. And so I pulled up some videos and one in particular was a video called Hyperinflation Nation. And I remember that I got to a part in the video where they said 72% of our economy is consumer-based economics, which is to say, the only reason that the economic engine is turning is because we're consuming things. And they asked the very prescient question, what happens when we can no longer consume? And although I knew that they were about to give me the answer, I didn't want their answer. I actually stopped the video. And I remember very clearly stopping it and asking the question, yeah, what happens? A friend sent me an article recently about a group called the Monroe Institute. And there's a quote from the Monroe Institute that I'll stick up here in the, in the video chat, excuse me, in the video. And what the quote basically talks about is that people can ask questions, that there is a mechanism in the universe for asking questions and receiving answers. And I actually identified this back in Oh, I mean, I don't know, when I was maybe 22, 24, 25, I could ask a question and the answer either would come to me or I would be presented with something that would have the answer in it or an experience that would complete the question. And so if you're wondering if that's true, if I'm making this up now because I just got this or not, I did an interview back in 2014 with Mike McClelland, Mike Cleland, excuse me, Mike Cleland, and I identified it with him back then as well. It's just, it's an oddity. But I remember sitting in 2009 in my basement and I, I stopped the video and I did, I asked, what happens when we can no longer consume? And what you have to do, and you have to be good at this, is you have to be good at letting go of all preconceptions of what you think is happening, what you think is going on. Because the answer is only going to be available to you if you're open to it. It's sort of like, you know, if you, if you come home and you spent the baby's diaper money on beer, right? And, the, and, and, and the mom's going, what did you do, you idiot? And you're going, I don't know what her problem is. No answer that someone is going to give you is going to break through your paradigm at that moment, if you know what I mean. So being able to ask these questions means that you have to just let go. You just have to go, what happens? 
And as I look at it now, I'm almost certain that at that moment I remote viewed the economic crash. I, I, can, I, I remote viewed a moment of intense fear, not just my fear. I, I, I experienced tangible, connective interaction with that moment. And someday if millions or billions of people are watching it, it's because we're past that very moment or at the very least at it. And it scared me. And unfortunately, although I asked what happens when, I didn't ask when when was. And in my mind, when was soon. And so my analytical side kicked in full of fear and I began making decisions out of that fear. And the thing is that one, coming to understand and connect with that moment was formative enough. But in 2012, in May of 2012, I was laid off and I had to face a lot of denial I had about the company and the company's long-term health. But having been laid off, having had this firm belief from this event that was coming, I started making decisions. And one decision I made was that I wasn't going to work. I was so angry at the system. I was so mad. And I literally took two and a half years off. I didn't work for two and a half years. It wasn't that I didn't do anything, but I did stop being financially productive. And if I have one, if I have one piece of wisdom to pass along, it comes from a Wookiee, hook song, a Wookiee foot song. And uh, the line says, if you're going through hell, don't stop. I stopped. And I don't recommend that you stop. But over time, what I've now realized looking back is that you can summarize much of that portion of my life in Christmas of 2012 because I had just started writing my book and I was certain that I knew exactly what was going to happen and that it was going to happen imminently. And the truth was that I had connected with the event of the crash, but I had not connected with any other information that comes after it. And that, that perspective I gained over the following years and mostly because I opened myself up to asking what is the what is the big picture what is the plan what what is happening and the more I asked questions like that the more things got revealed to me and one of the things that was revealed to me was that the peak of my paradigm of my false paradigm was that Christmas in 2012 where I thought everything I was doing would end up with me being financially wealthy. And the reality was that the bigger picture didn't involve anything that you could actually spend. It involved love. It involved caring. And it involved an entire civilization moving past the idea of money. you want to know why 2012 was the apocalypse for me, it's because that was the highest point in my confidence that I thought I would be wealthy. And the truth was, I expect to be wealthy. But not with money, with a whole host of other things, like family, friends, and memories, and experiences. And the last 10 years of my life, have really been about growing those experiences. And it's been about learning, learning what we should really value. This Christmas, I hope you value the song that started this video out because one day around Christmas time, my daughter had been watching video shows about animals and she came home and said, Papa, I wanna make a song. I have it all written out and that's where you got police shot my dog. It's, it's a gift. It was. Her heart was so sincere in it. 
that it's my hope as a Christmas gift someday, we can honestly say that we will never have another police officer shoot another dog. Right? Well, then shut my dog. Well, then shut my dog.